I've been an adult for a while now, and in recent years, I find myself wondering why things are the way they are. And more specifically, were they always like this? You see, I'm a runner, and as any runner can tell you, injuries are just a fact of life. It's not a matter of if, but when. I certainly haven't been immune to that fact. I've broken metatarsals, lost toenails, and have hundreds of frequent flyer miles with Achilles tendonitis, regardless of how far I run or how expensive my shoes are. And I'm forced to ask, why? The older generation of runners who have passed on their knowledge say that it's always been this way. Regardless of what shoes you wear or what surface you run on, you will get injured. And here are a dozen anecdotal treatments. But now the internet exists and... I'm not sure that's true. I was browsing through old race photos and I realized that the further back I went, the less shoe there was. I mean, what are those? Those don't look anything like my shoes. Something changed in the early 70s and we've been dealing with the consequences ever since. It wasn't always this way. What happened? This video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. One of the more popular New Year's resolutions is to get in shape, which usually includes a healthy dose of running, which is often people's least favorite exercise. Before we go any further, I want to say that if you're exercising, you aren't injuring yourself, and you're happy with what you're doing, keep doing it. Do not change your technique or equipment because of some YouTuber. But since it is March, if you've given up on your resolution because you just can't seem to get the hang of running or it hurts too much, the problem might not be you. Like hiking, running is one of those things that we all assume we can just do. You are so cute with this whole running thing. I'm a runner now. Me too. I mean, we've all got legs, we're all in a hurry sometimes, we're all runners when we need to be, right? <laughs> no? Just because I know the rules of chess and I can physically move the pieces around the board, that doesn't mean I'm any good at it. I'm just lucky I haven't hurt myself playing it yet. Or even if you can do a deadlift, you're not gonna go around calling yourself a power lifter because you know there's more to it than that. But running? We're all runners when we need to be, right? That wasn't always the case. Something changed that made us all think we're runners. And to explain how that happened, we need to go back to the 70s. Okay, so usually the joke is not that far, but in this case, we actually... That's better. I'm talking about the before time, in the long, long ago. In the 1870s, the most popular spectator sport in America, and perhaps the world, was something called pedestrianism, which is exactly what you think it is. Walking. Thousands of people from all over the country would get together to watch or listen to other people walk 500 miles around a track over the course of six days. Basically NASCAR without the car. Complete with collectible trading cards, celebrity endorsement deals, and doping scandals involving the precursor to cocaine. Fun for the whole family. The sport evolved over time into race walking, which is a lot of fun to watch assuming the Olympics still happen this year. The key difference between walking and running is that one foot must remain in contact with the ground at all times. They call this the heel-toe rule, not just because that's how you walk, heel-toe, but because the toe of one foot could not come up off the ground until the heel of the other was down. It is hilarious to watch them try to enforce this rule. Running was technically allowed in old school pedestrianism. They do it to stave off a cramp or recover from a trip, but it was generally seen as a poor long-term strategy. You want to conserve your energy. This isn't a sprint, it's a... This isn't a marathon, it's a... Okay. The various gambling scandals and riots caused by pedestrianism caused the sport to eventually fade into the background in favor of more exciting things like football and baseball. By the turn of the century, it was basically non-existent. Running, and sports in general, became something that only professional athletes did. Maybe you did it as an extracurricular in high school or college, but... That was it. The only adults who ran were in the Olympics. It was so rare and suspicious to see someone running on the street that the police would ticket you for improper use of a highway by a pedestrian. Strom Thurmond was one of those people in 1968. That's how recently running was still seen as weird. Something had to happen to change public opinion and normalize running, and as has been the case for many turning points in history, 
we can blame a book, Jogging, written in 1967 by Bill Bowerman. Bowerman was the track coach at the University of Oregon and also coached the US team during several international events. In 1962, he found himself in New Zealand, where he met Arthur Lydiard. Lydiard had organized the first running club in the world and invited Bowerman and his team to join them for a jog. Bowerman loved the idea so much, he decided to bring it back to the United States. The majority of the book describes several training regimens for different skill levels, but the first 50 pages or so describe how and why you should start jogging. Both Lydiard and Bowerman believed that regular exercise centered around jogging was good for your health, which was kind of a hot take to have at the time. Those of you with an ear for this sort of thing might have picked up on the fact that this is the first time I've referred to it as jogging. They invented and popularized this new word. Before them, jogging was something you did to a machine or your memory to get it to start working properly. It didn't refer to an exercise until the 1960s. Throughout his book describing various techniques and recommendations, Bowerman repeatedly draws a distinction between runners and joggers. Professional athletes are runners. You're a jogger. To get the most from the jogging program, you should periodically assess your progress. Unlike the runner, you may have to be your own coach and trainer. Runners have a number of diet habits that joggers can adopt. After a heavy workout, particularly on a warm day, runners will drink a cup of bullion. That's right, before Gatorade was invented, athletes would drink down bullion cubes to replace their electrolytes. This book is full of fun relics from the past like that. Take this height and weight chart. According to this, the only time I was a desirable weight was when I first started the channel, and that's assuming I'm a quote, large frame. But don't worry. Believe it or not, under that flab, you have the same body as successful runners. Yours just operates physiologically on a different plane. Well, I think I found my new Tinder bio. I'm not fat, my body just operates on a different plane, and I'm big boned. But as you might expect, there's a lot of casual sexism in here as well. Women seem to perform best when they feel well dressed. So a bit of style consciousness, providing it doesn't become competitive, is all right. Women who look and feel better in skirts should choose them with enough fullness for freedom of action. You yourself are the only equipment necessary. Many fitness programs cost a great deal before the first workout. Not so with jogging. Ladies with high heels will need a pair of flats. And here's where we get to the heart of the matter. Shoes. Bowerman wasn't only an award-winning track coach. He was also part owner of Blue Ribbon Sports, which had just started distributing Onitsuka Tiger shoes in America. But he was also an inventor and tinkerer. He modified his runner's shoes with different materials and shapes in order to give them a competitive advantage. He did it on his own for decades, but now he had a shoe company that could mass produce them. Many of his design changes had been implemented by the factory, and when his book came out, their most popular product was the Onitsuga Tiger Tiger Limber Up. This book was just an introduction to jogging for the average American, and as a result, his recommendations are very open-ended. Joggers come in all shapes and sizes, in a wide range of age levels and varying degrees of fitness. When they set out to jog, their techniques vary greatly. But remember, how you jog is never as important as that you jog. I agree with him. Any exercise is almost always better than no exercise, and as long as you're not hurting yourself, it doesn't really matter how you exercise. But just for the sake of being thorough, let's take a look at the techniques. There are three ways that your feet can land on the ground. This is known as foot strike. The first one he describes is heel toe, better known as heel striking. Similar to how you walk, the heel hits the ground first and you roll forward onto your toe before lifting off again. Experience shows that this heel to toe foot strike is the least tiring over long distances and the least wearing on the rest of the body. About 70% of good long distance runners use this technique. In a short time, with practice, you may find it the natural way to run. I have a lot to say about this description, but let's just follow along for now. Next is the flat foot technique or midfoot striking. This is where the entire foot falls flat at the same time, usually along the outer edge of the foot. The wide surface area pillows the foot strike and is easy on the rest of the body. About 20% of long distance runners use this technique. Which leaves 10% for the ball of the foot technique, now known as forefoot striking. This is when you land on the front of your foot near your toes and you settle onto your heel before pushing off again. Don't be surprised if almost instinctively you start with this method of foot strike, especially if you haven't run since your younger days. More women than men start with the ball of the foot technique. This is probably because they're used to high heels and find low heels unnatural. Setting aside the casual sexism, if this is the way I would instinctively run, 
Why would I have to train myself out of it with practice to run the more natural way? I'm also not sure where he got this 70% figure. In almost every picture of people running in the book, heel strikers are the minority. But he did say good long distance runners, so let's just pick one at random. I feel like I used to know who this guy is, but I have had a few concussions. The point is, He's not heel striking. So why is Bowerman pushing this method so hard? To answer that, we need to look at the 1968 Mexico City Olympics and look at a completely different sport, the high jump. It's a pretty straightforward event. You set the bar at a certain height, have all your competitors jump over it, anyone who doesn't make it is eliminated, then you raise the bar and repeat the cycle until only one person remains. Like reverse limbo. There are only so many ways you can run and jump over a bar though, and by the 50s, athletes had settled into one of two methods. A straddle technique, where you roll over the bar face down, and a scissor technique, where you kick your legs over one at a time. Oh, yeah. But in 1968, Dick Fosbury ran up to the bar and jumped over it backwards, winning the event and changing the sport forever. So much so that not using that new technique was putting yourself at a disadvantage. Every high jump record since then has used the Fosbury flop. After the 68 Olympics, Bowerman decided to see if running records could also be smashed by introducing a new technique. A technique he was already experimenting with heel toe. The problem is, when you run, you hit the ground with up to three times your body weight worth of force, which would shatter your heel, without the right shoes anyway. These are 1940s military issue athletic shoes. They're made of canvas, a gum rubber sole, and not much else. Some poor guy ran what must have been hundreds of miles in these things. These are what most people wore back then, and if you were to heel strike in these, you're gonna have a bad time. Luckily, Bowerman just invented the solution. This is a modern production of the first running shoe. It's made out of what feels like baseball material, which means it doesn't breathe very well. It's also not a very flexible shoe. But its key feature is its giant heel cushion the first of its kind. They wanted to call it the Aztec to commemorate the Mexico City Olympics, but Adidas already had a shoe by that name, so who beat the Aztecs? I give you the Cortez. I know, okay? This shoe hadn't been invented when he wrote his book, and his business partner at Blue Ribbon was not happy about his footwear recommendations. I was happy for him, but also for Blue Ribbon. His bestseller would surely generate publicity and bump our sales. Then I sat down and read the thing. My stomach dropped. In his discussion of proper equipment, Bowerman gave some common sense advice, followed by some confounding recommendations. He said the right shoes were important, but almost any shoes would work. Probably the shoes you wear for gardening or working around the house will do just fine. What? After the invention of the running shoe, heel toe became the one and only way to jog. Because now, there was a shoe that made it possible. Basically, Bowerman invented a new swimming stroke that would actually hurt you if you weren't wearing these special gloves, which he also happens to be selling. Because jogging is not just slow running. It's specifically the heel toe technique, but since most people aren't professional athletes, running and jogging have become somewhat synonymous. Professional athletes are runners. You're just a towel. Every jogging manual since the invention of the Cortez, even those written by Lydiard, state that the heel-toe method is the recommended way. It is far better to row the foot from heel to toe as a wheel is inclined to operate. I can't, I'm not, I, dude, I, I can't do a New Zealand accent, man. In the years after the 68 Olympics, Blue Ribbon Sports decided to stop distributing Onitsuka Tiger shoes and focus on their own products, rebranding themselves as Nike after the Greek goddess Athena. Nike struggled with numerous financial and customs issues, but their big break came in 1972 with their first celebrity endorsement, when an obscure shrimp billionaire and Medal of Honor recipient wore them during his famous cross-country ultra marathon. Little known fact, what did he earn the Medal of Honor for? Running. Okay, so it just occurred to me that this movie is 26 years old, so there's a decent chance some of you might not realize I'm joking. Forrest Gump sadly isn't a real person, and while the movie implies that he started the jogging fad, the real credit goes to Bowerman's book. And the real celebrity endorsement came from Steve Prefontaine, who had just dominated the 1972 Tokyo Olympics wearing... Adidas? So the endorsement came after the Olympics, but that didn't seem to matter to people. Bowerman never did any scientific studies to see whether his shoe was actually better than the competition, 
because he didn't have to. Steve Prefontaine's shattering records like a rock star was all the proof people needed. He was basically the Michael Phelps of running. It was cool now, and people started doing it by the millions all over the world. Now, what's this about, this, this jogging? What's but it all about? The idea is it's an exercise which people can take, no matter what age they are, to keep themselves fit. It's a well-balanced exercise worked out by an Olympic Games coach. The Boston Marathon started in 1897, after the first modern Olympics in Greece. Much like pedestrianism, it started off as a spectator event. Thousands of people would watch only a few dozen competitors. It didn't become an open event until the late 1970s. With all these new Americans getting interested in running, many cities all over the country began organizing their own 5Ks, 10Ks, and marathons. The New York City Marathon started in 1970. Initially, women weren't allowed to participate. It was thought that running 26.2 miles over the course of four to five hours would result in torn reproductive organs, which was the same reason they weren't allowed on trains in the 1800s. The New York City Marathon first let women compete in 1972, but only if they started 10 minutes before the men. All six of them spent those 10 minutes sitting on the starting line in protest. Once women could compete head-to-head -head against men over long distances, a weird trend started to develop. Running is the most egalitarian sport. Over short distances, men are faster, but the further out you go, the less the stuff between your legs seems to matter. When you get out to ultra marathon distances of 50 or 100 miles, women regularly beat men. Age is another interesting variable. Both men and women are at their fastest around age 26, but 16-year-olds are just as fast as 60-year-olds. Show me another sport where people nearing retirement have just as much of a chance of winning as high school students. You can't. It's almost like, as a species, we were made for this. There's a popular theory that we evolved as persistence hunters, because the one thing we have that other animals don't is the ability to sweat, which gives you way more endurance. If you were to chase an antelope, it's gonna run away, but it can't keep that speed up for very long and will eventually have to stop to catch its breath. If you keep running after it, you'll catch it in about 30 minutes. If your little group of humans made up of men, women, and the elderly can keep pace for just six miles, you'll be able to walk right up to it. It'll be completely exhausted. That theory is backed up by all the data we've been able to collect thanks to the fact that everyone is allowed to compete. Now we're able to get really cool graphics like this made. Every runner in the New York City Marathon wears a tracker and is released from the starting line in waves. I could stare at this graphic all day. But with all this new data, we started to notice some disturbing trends as well. Since the start of the New York City Marathon, the average American runner has gotten 20 to 30 minutes slower. And that's not because there are more amateur runners skewing the results. The New York and Boston Marathons have qualification times that you have to beat to even apply. These are America's top runners, and they're getting slower. Not only that, but they were getting injured in ways that didn't really happen before. Plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendon bursitis, the list goes on. Nike looked at this data and said, So we introduced this shoe, and millions of people started running. But now they're getting slower, and they're getting injured more often? Is it? No. What? What if we added arch support? So here's your foot, sitting flat on the ground. And here's a modern running shoe. It might look from the outside that it's also flat on the ground, but when we look inside and put a foot in it, we can see that the heel is raised. We call this, rather confusingly, the heel drop. For most average running shoes, the heel drop is 10 millimeters. Your heel is 10 millimeters higher than your toe to allow for added cushioning so you can run heel toe. For reasons we'll get to in a bit, that puts strain on various muscles and tendons that wouldn't normally be strained. So to fix that problem, they added arch support to fill in the gap between your foot and the shoe. When this further immobilization didn't solve the problem, they experimented with air pockets, gel injections, and flashing lights in the heel. For the record, Bill Bowerman thought that air pockets were a dumb idea, and they were. Early models like the Tailwind would often rupture, rendering the shoes completely useless. Even when they didn't fall apart, they were incredibly unstable, as anyone who's ever slept on an air mattress can tell you. They 
improved the design over time and eventually the Nike Air became their flagship product line, especially the spin-off, the Air Jordan. But not all of their innovations were just for show. Most every shoe until the 70s used this grooved pattern on the bottom of their soles. Until Bowerman destroyed his wife's waffle iron. Now every shoe looks like this. He figured out that this grid pattern was better at gripping the artificial polyurethane track that his Olympic and collegiate athletes ran on. Bowerman was only ever interested in making his racers faster under very specific conditions. So if I'm wearing his shoes running on his track using his heel-toe technique, why am I still getting injured? I'm not a track coach. I'm also not an Olympic athlete or even a marathon runner. The most I've ever done is a half marathon, and as tempting as it is to do a middle distance runner's guide to the lower leg, I figured I should ask someone. What's up? I'm Patrick. I do an anatomy channel called Corporis, and I used to work with injured runners in a sports medicine setting. Running hurts, and we have a lot of data to show it. Of the tens of millions of runners in the US, about half of them will experience an injury this year, and the majority of them are overuse injuries. Not something like a broken bone or a sprained ankle, but injuries that stack up over time. Now, before we even think about shoes, there are two things that by far and away predict injury more than anything. How much you run, and whether or not you've had a previous injury. Running injuries usually have multiple influences. So when exercise scientists try to isolate and study different factors like running form or a heel cushion, we can get conflicting evidence. But how much you run and previous injuries keep coming up as good predictors of injury. So just like, Keep that in mind. Most of the research has focused on arch support, not on heel striking versus forefoot striking. It seemed like giving somebody with low arches some arch support alleviated pain and helped prevent injuries. So that's where most of our data is up to this point. Now, in the last decade, researchers have finally started paying attention to the thick heel pads that Bowerman was recommending back then. So excuse the time paradox here, but the research took like 40 years to catch up. When someone lands heel first, the rest of their foot pivots down, collapsing onto the ground. As their body moves forward, all of their mass is on top of the foot. Then as the center of gravity moves forward, they toe off and go for the next step. When someone lands forefoot first, they kind of tiptoe into their step and their foot lands more slowly onto the ground. Then their body moves over the foot, they step forward and repeat. And while this isn't like a hard and fast rule, there is some evidence that says that people will change how they run based on what kind of shoes they're wearing. So they'll tend to be heel strikers if they have thick shoes and tend to be forefoot strikers if they're bare feet or have minimalist shoes. But at some point, your skeleton needs to absorb the force from the ground. We call those forces ground reactive forces. It's that whole equal and opposite reaction thing. You're landing with a certain force on the ground and the ground pushes pushes back into your body. When runners strike down with their heel, they see a big spike, a little dip, and another spike as the rest of the foot lands. Then, as they press off the ground and onto the other foot, total forces decrease. Cushioned shoes change the curve a little bit, but not much. At their peak, the ground transferred about two and a half times their body weight and force up their legs. When we measure this in forefoot strikers, they experience the same ground reactive force when their whole foot landed, but with a mellower slope upwards. So that initial contact was less forceful. That's because it takes advantage of how your ankle joint and your calf are set up. The foot itself is made up of long phalanges here, metatarsals at your midfoot, tarsals, which is this puzzle of bones here, and the calcaneus, or heel bone. There's a shock absorbing fat pad under it, but it's not much. Finally, your talus creates your ankle joint between the long bones of the shin, tibia, and fibula. Your gastrocnemius and soleus, or calf muscles, are your biggest ankle moving muscles, so they're able to withstand plenty of body weight. They insert at the heel via the Achilles tendon, and they're the main muscles involved when you land on your forefoot. You have other smaller ankle muscles that start as small muscles close to the knee and narrow out into long tendons that wrap under your feet before they attach to a bone. Not only is the calf bigger than them, it also has an advantage in leverage. See, when you land on your forefoot, you create a lever. There's an axis at the ball of your foot, your body weight comes down over the midfoot, and your calf is creating a force way out on the end of the lever, providing a mechanical advantage in this situation. Compared to the levers created by other joints and muscles, the calf is the most efficient lever type in our body. So a forefoot striker is able to use their strong calf muscle to slow their body's descent and reduce that initial bump. But when we look at heel strikers wearing shoes, 
we see a smaller initial impact than when they heel strike barefoot. So did Bowerman's design actually help them? Well, those graphs don't tell the whole story because that force had to go somewhere. When we look at the forces on individual joints, we see that heel strikers absorb more force in their hips and knees, while forefoot strikers absorb more force in their calf and ankle. Now, we still can't say that heel striking causes injuries, but we do see different types of injuries when we compare heel strikers to forefoot strikers. A study in the British Journal of Sports Medicine from 2016 surveyed barefoot runners and runners with shoes and found injuries that matched the running style. Heel strikers got more musculoskeletal injuries like plantar fasciitis, glute and hamstring strains, and knee pain, while barefoot runners got more injuries to the soles of their feet like blisters and cuts, and overuse injuries of some of the tendons like the peroneals, Achilles tendon, and tibialis posterior. So it's a trade-off. Maybe it's something minor like a blister, or maybe it's a musculoskeletal injury, but having pain is a sign that maybe you shouldn't do the thing. If you run a lot, you're gonna get hurt, but how would you like it to hurt? Pain isn't weakness leaving the body. It's your body telling you to stop doing something. If you're able to dampen the pain using medication or protective clothing, you're gonna keep doing it. It's the illusion of safety. Helmets, pads, and cushions are great for protecting your skin and to a lesser extent your bones, but they don't do much for soft tissue, like joints, muscles, and tendons, or your brain. Oddly enough, during the 70s and 80s, the football helmet also underwent several changes to make it more safe, adding things like a hard shell and a face mask. Somewhat counterintuitively, the safer the helmet got, the more concussions players seemed to suffer, including dozens of micro concussions which are just as dangerous. How did that happen? I posed this question on Twitter. How can we reduce the number of concussions suffered by football players? And this answer really stuck out to me. That is true, more people get concussions from bicycle helmets. But there's a difference in purpose here. Bike helmets are designed to protect you against an accidental fall. Football helmets are designed to be put on so you can run full speed into a wall. Actually, it's not a wall, it's another person running full speed at you. Whenever I see someone do a backflip into the end zone and land on their head, the first reaction is usually, it's a good thing he was wearing a helmet, but he probably wouldn't have done that if he wasn't wearing one. Dampening the pain with a helmet or cushion just gives you the confidence to do things that will still hurt you, you just won't immediately feel it. So while there are proposed rule changes that might reduce the number of concussions, the real answer is to probably just go back to this. There is no better helmet that has yet to be invented that will somehow stop your brain from smashing into the inside of your skull. It may be less fun to watch, but fewer people will get hurt. Hurt. Oh yeah, we wouldn't want people to get hurt playing football, but I have an idea that could make it even better. Why don't we just have the players wear bras? I'm not really sure that's the part of the body that really needs to be protected. Yeah, and instead of helmets, they should wear little tin foil hats because, you know, it's the future. I mean, that's closer, I guess. Who are you? You look familiar. Well, you have had a few concussions. Okay. Luckily, football concussions only affect a very small portion of the population. Mostly kids, now that I think about it. Maybe we should do something about that. But we can apply the same thinking to running. Maybe these padded heel running shoes are just like football helmets. They dampen the pain of doing something you shouldn't be doing. Maybe you shouldn't be slamming the part of your body that's so well known to be a weak spot that even demigods are felled by it into the ground with upwards of 500 pounds of force several thousand times. We didn't know this at the time, but running seems to become more popular during times of national crisis. Moral crises, not economic ones. While the first boom was after Watergate, it shouldn't surprise you to hear that after 9-11, there was a surge in 5K, 10K, and marathon attendance. This new generation of runners were immediately met with the same injuries. Luckily, the world was smaller and more interconnected, so while American runners were getting slower, international runners, like those from Kenya, were getting faster and had fewer injuries. What were they doing differently? Much like Bowerman in the 60s, one guy thought that maybe there was a better technique, a technique that many Kenyans were already doing. This guy became known as Barefoot Ted. He went to a company called Vibram, which had a line of sailing products which he wanted to try wearing for running. They took a look at the modern running shoe and its giant heel cushion and it's gone! I present to you the Vibram Five Fingers. Originally meant to grip the deck of a slippery yacht, Barefoot Ted wore these during an ultra marathon in the Copper Canyons of Mexico. And they looked upon their creation and saw that it was good. I'm just kidding, there were actually 
massive problems with these at first. They promoted them as a way to reduce foot injury, which if you've seen my MLM video, you know why they can't make claims like that. But the fault isn't entirely with Vibram. For the last 40 years, you've been told that heel toe is the only way to run. You know you can't do it barefoot, but for some reason you think these will protect you. These are four foot striking shoes. If you're gonna go from a cast like this to a glove like this, you're gonna have to change your technique and you're gonna have to do it very, very slowly. You're gonna be engaging muscles that you haven't used in years if ever. Some people found that this new forefoot striking technique allowed them to run further and faster than they ever have, sparking the barefoot revolution. A quick reminder, there's nothing new about this. In the average running shoe, your heel sits 10 millimeters higher than your toes. Minimalist shoes, like Vibram Five Fingers, typically have a heel drop of five millimeters or less, with most of them being zero. This means your heel and toe are level, which allows your Achilles to fully extend rather than being constantly relaxed like an normal running shoe. Soon after that, several university track teams, including Stanford, started to train barefoot or wear minimalist shoes. Sensing that they were about to lose their market share, Nike introduced their own version, the Nike Free with a selection of heel drops from zero to three to seven. But a few years later, they went in the completely opposite direction, introducing a maximalist shoe known as the Vaporfly. While a minimalist shoe has a heel drop of zero and a normal running shoe has 10 millimeters, depending on the specific model, the Vaporfly features a 15 to 20 millimeter heel drop, with the entire heel cushion measuring 40 millimeters or an inch and a half. The Olympics banned these shoes because they gave runners an unfair advantage, but Nike is a huge multinational corporation with a lot of lawyers. After a few years of negotiating, the Olympics decided that these shoes are the new bar. No new shoe can have more than 40 millimeters of heel cushion. I hope this is obvious, but these shoes are undeniably heel striking shoes. They have really complicated names like the Nike Zoom X Vaporfly Next Percent or the Vaporfly 4% Flyknit. The 4% meaning they improve your running efficiency by 4%. If you were trying to sell me car tires that increased my gas mileage by 4%, I probably wouldn't even bother. But I'm not trying to break records where 4% would matter. Six months ago, Elliot Kipchoge and his entire team wore slightly different models of the Vaporfly when they ran a marathon in just under two hours, a time barrier previously thought unbreakable. They didn't consider it a new record though because of all the help he got. These were basically laboratory conditions. But still, now we know it's at least possible. What strikes me most about watching them run is that even though they're wearing a shoe specifically designed for heel striking, not a single person on the team is doing that. They're all forefoot strikers. Even when a footfall looks like it's mostly flat, you have to remember that they're wearing one and a half inch heels. So they're always up on their toes. Why aren't they using these shoes as intended? Maybe it's because forefoot striking is the least jarring way to run as past Patrick described. Or maybe it's because the shoes didn't matter at all, as evidenced by the fact that he once ran a 204 marathon in shoes that were literally falling apart. And maybe Nike didn't want to miss out on a marketing opportunity. In any case, he's a professional athlete with hundreds of people making sure he's on pace, monitoring his diet and hydration, and helping him figure out exactly how his foot should land every single time. He's a professional athlete. You're just a towel. When you go into a shoe store, they're most likely gonna give you a shoe based on the shape or form of your foot, meaning the size and whether or not you have high arches, when they should be fitting shoes based on the function of your foot. A decade or two ago, if you went into a specialty running store, the only function they'd ask you about is whether you overpronate or supinate. They wouldn't actually watch you run, they'd just ask you, and then put you in some corrective shoes that don't actually fix the problem. They just let you keep running in your messed up gait with without any pain. Nowadays, the important distinction is whether you prefer to heel strike or forefoot strike, and you need to have the right shoe to match your technique. And just like swimming strokes, you can change if you want to. I wanna make this clear. Do not change your technique because of me. Do not change your shoes because of me. I don't currently wear any of the shoes I've talked about in this video. So if you're running without issue, 
Keep doing what you're doing. Running is just plain good for you, not only your physical health, but your mental health. You may notice that the more you run, the more everything else in your life just sort of falls into place. Your confidence increases, your diet changes, you sleep better, you're more fun between the sheets, the list goes on. I would rather you ran in anything than not run at all. But if you're like me and running has always been your weakness to the point that you barely pass the army PFT with seconds to go, maybe it's your technique. When I switched to four foot striking, I went from dreading any run of any distance to regularly winning my age group in all the races I did. Here's a veteran's 5k, here's a... It's okay, it was 2009, people were really stoked on him back then. Wait... Now I remember you. Oh, now you remember? Yeah, I saw you after going to curiositystream.com slash knowing better. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers that you can access across multiple platforms. By signing up using curiositystream.com slash knowing better and using the promo code knowing better, you'll also get access to Nebula, the new streaming service built by fellow YouTubers to create videos without worrying about having proper arch support. Member South Park, I member, and you you can remember too by checking out my episode of Working Titles, a series hosted by a different creator each week talking about their favorite TV show opening credits. I've been working on this side project for a while and it should be coming out soon. Check it out on Nebula by also signing up for Curiosity Stream. When you use the code Knowing Better at checkout, you'll get the first month for free. You'll also be supporting the channel when you do. Bowerman invented a new technique for running that he thought would be more efficient, but would actually injure you without the proper shoes so he invented them. But the injuries continued and people got slower. So he invented all kinds of supplemental supports to fill in the gaps and protect areas that were left exposed by his original idea, which just made the problem worse. They even make socks with arch support now. Yeah, I bought them. I know they don't actually do anything, okay? It wasn't until a second generation of runners came around that people started to ask whether arch supports and gel inserts were actually necessary. After looking at how other countries did things, they realized, they weren't. It hadn't always been this way. A few people in 1972 just decided that this is how running shoes should be made. And we've been dealing with that decision ever since. To hold on to their market share in the face of the barefoot revolution, Nike introduced all sorts of options at different tiers of heel drop for you to choose from, from minimalist to maximalist. It's on you to make an informed decision about which one is right for you. With it being a new decade and with people trying to find ways to stay fit outside of the gym, Maybe it's time for a third running boom, only this time focus on your technique. Even with large gatherings canceled for a while, virtual 5Ks and 10Ks are now a thing. So put your shoes on, wh whichever shoes you're comfortable in, and let's go, because Actually, now- Actually, before you go, you should probably let people know that you don't think anyone you talked about during this video is a bad person. Bowerman, Lydiard, Nike, Vibram, they were all just trying to help people get healthy. And not everyone can run, okay? Do whatever exercise you find fulfilling, because now, you know better. He... He took my job! I'm officially streaming on Twitch now, so if you'd like to see me play games and stuff, link down below. If you'd like to add your name to this list of pedestrians, head on over to patreon.com slash knowingbetter, or for a one-time donation, paypal.me slash knowingbetter. Don't forget to jog that subscribe button or the join button if you want to go the extra mile. Check out the merch at knowingbetter.tv, follow me on Twitter and Facebook, and join us on the subreddit.